last week on Norco 80. I've heard people talking, you know, about, hey, he had no business being up there with a gun he didn't know how to handle, and uh, did he shoot Evans? You could really see that. The defense really had nothing to say. In terms of minimizing the conduct of any of the defendants, they couldn't do it. All I kept hearing, and it started ringing in my ears, is guilty. Guilty. All right, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. We're recording right now. Okay, uh, I would like to make a statement before we begin first. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, of course. All right. Okay, uh, I want the listeners to know that I'm deeply ashamed and embarrassed for my uh, role in this, in this, in this uh, crime, first of all. And I've kept my silence because I was thinking this thing would just go away. But obviously it hasn't, and there are things that uh, should be said to the Delgado and Evans family for this ultimate tragedy for them, that I wish the situation were not so, and and I ask their forgiveness for that. um, I'm I'm glad for the opportunity, and with that, uh, thank you, Antonia, for this forum to be able to say this. I'm ready. I'm Antonia Cerejido, and from LAS Studios and Futuro Studios, this is Norco 80, a series about God, guns, survivalism, and the bank robbery that changed policing forever. Chapter 7, George Smith. I knew eventually that we would fight the Soviet Union. I was convinced of that. Of the five men who robbed a bank in Norco in 1980, only two are alive today. Manny and Billy Delgado died on the scene, and the other three would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. Russ Harvin died in December of 2019 of heart failure while in prison. His older brother, Chris Harvin, is 70 years old and is currently at a prison in Vacaville, California. He denied a request for an interview. That leaves George Smith. In the 40 years he's been in prison serving a life sentence, he's never agreed to a broadcast interview. After hearing so much about George and his intentions, we wanted to ask him directly why he robbed Norco's Security Pacific Bank and how he rationalized his anxieties of the times into a plan that would go so terribly wrong. George never speaks to the press. He sends all media requests to his daughter, Monica, and they usually end there. So when we reached out to her directly, we had little hope that we'd hear back. For two weeks, we waited, and then, she left us a voicemail. My name is Monica Miller. I am calling you regarding an email that you sent me. George considered our request, and while he did, Monica agreed to be interviewed. So, Monica, if you could just say your your name and however much you want to tell us about your daily life now. Okay. Um, my name is Monica Miller. I am, gosh, 43 going on 44. I am a mom of two and I have lived in the Maryland area now for the last four years. So what are some early memories you have of your father? Unfortunately, most of my my vivid memories are from after he was arrested. Monica was only about three and a half years old when George was arrested. And she only remembers a couple of fleeting moments of the time before the robbery. Even though her parents were split up, her mom, Hannah Palmer, would bring Monica to visit her dad. I was very, very close to my father. My mother is a 
extreme health food addict. Um, she is to this day and <laughs> would never let me have sugar or things like that. And I would go to visit my dad. And those are some of the memories I have. He would sneak me, he would let me eat junior mints. <laughs> while I would sit on his couch and he would massage my feet. I loved him to like, he did like the acupuncture, like painful massages. And even at like three years old, that was like our routine. I would like hop up and he would give me chocolate and <laughs> he would massage my feet. Monica was still a young child when George was convicted. And so for decades, she has had to build her relationship with her father through weekly calls and occasional, sometimes only annual, visits to prison. What sorts of things would you talk about with your with your dad? So my dad loves to talk and he's has a, a limited um what's the word I'm looking for? He has a limited audience overall where he's at. As I've gotten older, you know, there's regular life stuff that we discuss. He has very strong opinions still about the world, what's going on in the world, um, you know, the religious aspects of it. Um, so I, it's kind of a joke. I don't know if that's appropriate to say. What do you mean? When I go now, it's kind of like my mom will say like, okay, did you get preached to for the last like eight hours or four <laughs> hours or whatever it is? And it's like, yes, I got preached to. I, yeah, I hear a lot of, for lack of a better t- phrase, doomsday prepping and kind of advice. And I've had that my whole life. A month and a half after our interview with Monica, we finally reached George on a phone from a state prison in Corcoran, California. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Everyone should be here. Through Monica, we were able to set up a series of 15-minute phone calls with him. That's the longest you have per call before you get cut off. George would call us back when we got disconnected. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Each time, his mood seemed slightly different. Hello. All right. Antonio. Oh. You're good? Well, hi, Antonio. How's it going? Wait, wait, wait. Next question. Hi, George. Uh, are we good? Yeah. Okay, I remember your question. Do you want me to answer it right now? Yes, please, yes. We spoke to him over the course of several days when he was able to get access to the communal phones. All right, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can. Okay, good. So my first question for you is just um, what your daily life is like. What is my daily life now mm-hmm. or then? No, now. Are we talking about today? Yes, today. We are on quarantine because of the coronavirus and uh, therefore we are confined to our bunks for most of the day. We started the interview by going all the way back to the beginning. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? What were your interests at school? Paleontology. Really? When I was really young, yeah. What sparks that interest? I love dinosaurs. Nine years old, eight years old. And uh, the whole formations of the universe and everything were always interesting. I used to love to watch plants grow. They'd, you know, take things out of the bean bag and put it in the ground and watch it sprout up. It was just, uh, I guess the gift of faith was uh, early for me. It didn't take, it wasn't a far reaching for me to, to see there had to be a creator and all this. George brings up his faith in our conversation pretty much right away. He says he didn't grow up in a religious household, though he did attend church with his grandparents. His father worked in construction, and his mother would occasionally work a nighttime shift at a factory. Hannah uh, mentioned to us, that there may have been abuse in with your parents and that, for instance, your mother put out cigarette butts on your hands, on your palms? It doesn't matter. Those, 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 those are irrelevant to any, any discussion. Both my parents are dead. Uh, both my parents, in the end, confessed, confessed to Christ, believe it or not, before they died. That was one of my prayers and one of my concerns. As far as all that other stuff goes, it's 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 irrelevant. George's mother was Japanese American. He says he's also part Native American, part Irish, and part English. He told me he was what you could call the ultimate American. 
so you know, you have like a conglomeration of what you call your your ultimate American. How's that? <laughs> You know, growing up, what role do you feel your identity, being half Japanese, played in your upbringing? Well, I'm sure it had a large uh, factor into it because we're talking about my parents marrying after World War II. We we experience prejudice all the time now. Mm -hmm. They weren't Japanese, they were Japs, right? And killing them and hating them was was put into the culture. And then after that, uh, you know, it's gonna it's gonna carry on over. It always does, especially when you're young. <laughs> like, why wouldn't young people call a, a child a jab? I mean, it would make you know, it, it obviously it's easy to do, right? You do you, 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 you can let it destroy you, or you can sit there and go, okay, this is the way it is. Then he launches into some Japanese, which he has been learning in prison. There's positive aspects of every culture. Got it? If, if, you, learn, if you try to embrace the negative, then you're gonna, uh, you could turn out to be a monster. You have 60 seconds remaining. Okay, I gotta go. We'll be right back. We're back. When George Smith began preparing for the apocalypse he feared was coming, he imagined surviving in a remote location, living off the grid, He was a survivalist. And in many ways, the concept of survivalism has always been at the heart of American identity. This idea of self-reliance dates back to pioneer times. But self-reliance took on a new aesthetic during the Cold War. It meant preparing for a potential global meltdown. Make no mistake, nuclear attack would be a terrible catastrophe. But that is a threat that can be combated. Can with knowledge, preparation, and courage be faced and conquered. When George was growing up, surviving meant stockpiling cans and dried goods and building up a refuge in case of a nuclear bomb. No home in America is modern without a family fallout shelter. This is the nuclear age. In the early 60s, the U.S. Department of Defense had distributed pamphlets teaching American families how to make bunkers. A fallout shelter you can build yourself is open for public inspection in Thomasville, Georgia. A civil defense pamphlet, the Family Fallout Shelter, contains plans and construction details for this and other types of shelters. By 1965, when there were an estimated 200,000 bunkers across the U.S., The fear of nuclear proliferation was growing, and it soon reached George. You don't remember the era of uh, duck under your desk because a nuclear bomb was covered, duck and cover? Duck and cover. Duck and cover. This is an official civil defense film. I went to school, they had this sickness ceremony, they sound the alarm and everybody would dive under their desk, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Getting ready for the Soviet Union to nuke us. And then in, uh, was 62 or thereabouts, with a Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm watching it on TV. President John F. Kennedy broadcast a special message to the nation from his office in the White House. One second away from World War III. As an attack requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. What made you sign up for the Army? Well, we, the country was at war, and I'm an American. And not this anarchist that was running around just trying to destroy the world. During his military service in the early 1970s, George would be stationed in Germany. What he saw during his service impacted him even after he returned home. I'd worked with uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, 
And now I can only imagine what has progressed to to date since I've been out of the military since the 70s. People have no idea what's going to happen. We've used the atomic bomb, but we haven't used the hydrogen bomb yet. But that seems just right around the corner. You, you've you talked about how you were a soldier, but this was a time also where there was a, a pretty big anti-war movement, but that never called to you. Of course. No, no. You, if I'm a soldier, what does it make me? That makes me a basic conservative, right? I'm also very religious. I was even religious then. George was exploring evangelical church services during the 1970s, a moment in time when the evangelical movement was gathering momentum and political power. In 1976, Jimmy Carter, a born-again Christian and Democrat, was elected president. But by the end of the decade, conservative Christians had become a force in the Republican Party, propelling Ronald Reagan into office. A chance to make our laws and government not only a model to mankind, but a testament to the wisdom and mercy of God. And candidate Reagan would stoke the same fear that George had, that his way of life could come to an end because of the Cold War. We must ask ourselves, is America more secure? Are we more confident of peace in the world than we were just four years ago? You know the answer to those questions. It is no. We must build peace upon strength. There is no other way. Yesterday, you described yourself as a, you know, as a young conservative. And I find that to be kind of antithetical to, um, you know, growing marijuana. So I'm, I'm curious how you thought about that then. Oh, no, that was the whole, it was, that was where the money was at. Everything for the cause at that point. And far as being a, a conservative, uh, conservative is a capitalist, isn't it? Where do you think you developed those political views? You know, like, that, that's a good, for me, I, I, I guess it was inert me. It was like, my dad was a, a Democrat, in fact. <laughs> but I, I, I seen a different perspective, especially in the world, because the world, the world hates the United States. We got no friends. And if you want to find out, go out and see the world and see the, uh, the, the poverty and the despair out there. And, and that uh, uh, this is the great experiment. This is, you cannot go to Japan and become Japanese, okay? But you can come from Japan and be an American. Go figure, huh? George's nationalism goes hand in hand with survivalist culture. The idea that anyone in the United States can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. The term survivalism was actually first used in print in 1976 in a newsletter written by a man named Kurt Saxon. Saxon had already been writing manuals about how to live off the land, store food, build munitions, and stockpile guns. These aren't ordinary books. These are survival manuals. Pamphlets, magazines, and paperbacks on everything from self-defense and food storage to building a fortified bunker. Kurt Saxon also had a series of books called The Poor Man's James Bond. All hell is going to break out, not only in this country, but all over the world in a couple of years, maybe five. So I would like all of you to become just as self-sufficient and well-armed as possible. This was at the same time that the anarchist cookbook, a manual on how to make bombs and explosives, became popular. A book that George and his friends used in preparation for the robbery. When did you start um, purchasing firearms? As uh, soon as I got out of the military. First got, got, got started purchasing firearms, it just uh, that I could, I could purchase firearms. I've been in the military, I was around weapons so for years, and I got used to them. He says he needed to buy guns for protection. It was never an intention when I first started arming myself that it was to rob a bank and to uh, grow marijuana. I was arming myself because I, I knew eventually that we would fight the Soviet Union. I was convinced of that. And when George met Chris Harvin, his Parks Department co-worker, they talked about the end of the world with urgency. Oh, we talked a lot about the 
the, the, the political structure, what's going out, what's going on, and what what we, we perceived that what was going to happen. We both believe that the the Great Tribulation was getting ready to start. When did you and Chris decide to move in together? Oh, uh, when we decided that the, the the tribulation was coming at any moment, and that it's time to uh, button down the hatch and commit everything to the to the the endeavor to the cause. So, do you remember the house? What it looked like? How you chose it? What was so? What was what the house? thinking? The house that you moved yeah, in with we chose Chris. It because of the back, because because it had like a third of an acre. Mm-hmm. And the main thing, the main thing to make the money was the, the marijuana crop. So the greenhouse was put up. You have 60 seconds remaining. <laughs> you know, you get me to Gavin and I can't stop. It's at Chris and George's house where they dug the bunker and grew the weed that George preached his ideas to friends, including Billy and Manny Delgado. Oh, they, they, they were uh, good, good young men. They're, they were men of faith. They weren't hoodlums or gangsters or anything like that. They believed. They uh, uh, good senses of humor. Uh, were uh, were brothers to me. I, I would guess it sense because we they would look like they act, they would became like my little brothers, and they would uh, come, come 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 visit just to visit, and we we would uh, talk because uh, they listened. They perceived the same thing in the end that that's uh, my influence on them because I was so sure that this uh, conflict was getting ready to happen. The conflict George is referring to is the end of the world prophecy some Christians interpret in the book of Revelations. Well, there's a lot of limited literature. That, you know, you gotta, there's books like The Great Late Planet Earth and stuff like that that were out there at the time of like bestsellers. And so you would pick up on stuff like that and you would read it. And, and then we got, I got the, I misled myself. What do you mean? Well, I was, I was convinced at that point that the tribulation was going to start at any time. I don't know if you understand any Christian theology, but uh, there's a time when the world is it's going to be so bad that it'll make World War II and all of them look like child's play. And me working with nuclear weapons and such like that, if you really knew what it looked like, I think you'd have a little bit more concern. But anyhow, I, I was convinced that it was going to, it was getting ready to start. There's a part of the Bible that some interpret to say that the rapture, the return of Christ, will happen a generation after Israel becomes a nation. George originally understood a generation to mean 40 years, and so he figured that the end of the world was coming around 1980. I thought a generation was 40 years in the Bible. Israel was wandered as a less of a generation. But uh, later on, I find out, after studying it myself in prison, it's 120 years. So, you know, way off, way off base. And I believe it'll start at any time still, but not in the time frame that they expected at that time. George frames his mistake as one of miscalculation, that he got the math wrong. But he still believes the world is coming to an end, someday. We'll be right back. We're back. The last series of questions I want to ask you, you know, we've been talking to a lot of people and people have said things about you. And I want to give you the opportunity to respond to very specific things that were said. So whose idea was it to rob the bank? I'm not sure if it it came up with me mentioning it or somebody else, but I don't... I don't recall exactly who mentioned it. But now we just all eventually agreed on it. Chris, in the interview with the police, he pretty directly says that it was your idea to come up with the robbery. No, it could have been, but you know, I, I don't. 
remember specifically saying let's rob a bank, but they could have been. I'm okay. not going to say it wasn't, but I, I, got, I don't remember me actually bringing up robbing a bank, but it could have been. George even admitted himself in his interrogation with the police that the plan to rob the bank was his plan. You told me on a previous call that before you went, the five of you vowed to not hurt uh, or to not kill. Could you, could you just tell me a little bit about that? To kill for money would be completely wrong for me. I can't speak for everybody, but we agreed that we we're not going to kill. All of us are people of, uh, of a, a skewed faith that was still faith. And uh, we knew it would be wrong to kill for money, period. And then uh, when the action started, that was what was happening. And that's why they lost so many vehicles. George is referencing the over 30 patrol cars that were damaged over the course of the robbery, shootout, and chase. He is citing this as evidence that they never meant to shoot towards people, that they were aiming for vehicles. Did you shoot towards the police? Were you shooting towards them when you were on Light- in Lytle Creek? Did you shoot towards the police? I didn't fire a shot there. If you didn't have any intent to kill, why did you bring such heavy firearms, such intense artillery? Yeah, that was like, if, if, if it went against us, right? If you knew it was going to go against us, then we flee. And then you go into the mountains. And you go in with what you got. If you're going to survive out there, you better have something to hunt with and things like that. It was, it's, everything was to escape. What George is trying to say here is that they had stockpiled weapons and the survival gear, not for the robbery, but for afterwards when they would flee into the wilderness. You know, I did the robbery. I tried to do the robbery. Okay, I did the robbery. I did fight back. Um, those things are... In fact, but far, far as being this mad dog killer, no. A big point George wanted to bring up was how Manny had died. He didn't believe Manny died by his own hand. George believes Manny was executed by the police. Nobody commits suicide the way they dangled that bullet so that came down. He was on his knees and the guy stood over at the top of him, shot him, shot him from a downward angle. And that's all in the autopsy um, reports and We brought this up in a previous episode. The autopsy report says Manny died from a close contact wound to the chest. But contrary to what George says, the report states that the angle of the shot was, quote, a straight frontal wound, end quote, and not shot from above. But there still is some mystery around who shot the fatal round, because the bullet that killed Manny Delgado has never been recovered. Like I said, I sent it to the Herald Examiner. I sent it to the Times. Uh, I couldn't get no traction anywhere from anybody, not even my attorney, and then the district attorney drops the count. So I can't bring it up in court. So they muzzled me real quick on that one, but I vowed then that I wouldn't forget it, and every time somebody would talk to me, I said, I should remember Emmanuel Delgado who was murdered. How did you find out that Emmanuel had died? Oh, I found out in the hospital. My uh, dad came to see me, and he told me that uh, both both my uh, friends were dead. Do you remember how you felt? Devastated. Uh, I condemned myself completely. Uh, told the Creator, Father in Heaven, that I deserve uh, to be uh, sent to hell. All the whole, uh, put the extreme prejudice upon myself. Throughout our conversation, I sometimes feel a waffling from George about his relationship with God. He at times admits to going against God's wishes, but he also positions himself as someone uniquely qualified to understand God's messages. And he still believes something big is coming and that no one else really gets it. Still gave a lectures yesterday to uh, to different people about the information that I know that people don't know or they don't perceive to know. This particular point is the one I find most frustrating about George. I felt a sense of condescension as we spoke, that he believed his perception of reality was somehow greater than everyone else's. 
The moment I felt this the strongest is when he dismissed previous statements from his ex-wives. Okay. Then um, we've spoken to both Rosie, Miranda, and Aunt Hannah, and they mentioned that you got physically violent with them, um, kicking Rosie in particular when um, you believe she... Physically violent with them? Yeah, physically violent. Uh, I don't... I got mad at uh, Hana one time and I kicked her in the ass, but that's as far as that went. And I apologized immediately after. As far as Rosie goes, that was, you know, we're 15, 15 years old. And I'm really immature. And as far as violence, I don't know. I, I might have, I slapped her. But uh, the bottom line is, uh, there was no, what's called, with, hitting her with my fist or beating her to a pulp. I, I slapped her once, twice, but at 15. She says you, uh, I, I kicked her you in kicked her in the stomach when you thought she was pregnant. And I kicked her in the stomach? That's what she says, yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 that's how she says it. I, I, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> And maybe that's how she remembers the kick in the ass, but no, no. And it wasn't because she was pregnant. It was because she was telling me she's leaving me. I mean, I can't, no, I, sorry, I laugh at that. That is, that was, I, 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 like I said, I got no ill will for none of them. I pray for both of them, both Wilson Linda, her name is Wilson Linda and Hannah Lohr. George later wanted to clarify some of what he said here. He sent a statement, part of which reads, quote, I carry no ill will towards Rosalinda. The things she remembers about me are not true. I never kicked her in the stomach because she said she was pregnant, nor wanted us to die together or wanted to kill anyone, end quote. George Smith was sentenced to life in prison. But it wasn't just him who had to deal with the consequences of his actions. This is the last question. What do you hope people take away um, after hearing this story? What do you hope that people who hear about this learn? I I did this for uh, Emmanuel Delgado and the Evans family. What they take away with it is... I don't, don't believe in lying, okay? So I, I, it happened 40 years ago. Uh, I was young and dumb and stupid, fine. And uh, I haven't, I I didn't pursue this interview, obviously, that you can tell on that, right? In fact, I've denied access to me from many people who have tried over the years to talk to me. I'm doing this now because my chair of duty in this body is about done. I don't know how much longer I'm going to last. And it doesn't matter. Everybody dies. But what we do is we do the best we can, and we stay to the faith. There's a whole, whole, whole bunch more that people can't see because I've committed myself to finding the truth and those truths. And I've been doing that for 40 years in prison. While George has spent years searching for truths behind bars, his daughter Monica has also been searching for a way to come to terms with what her father did. How are you processing all of that? That's what has brought me here today, probably, to talk to you. Monica has worked to reconcile two very different ideas of him. The father who rubbed her feet with the robber who wielded assault rifles and bombs in Norco, California. As I look through and, you know, back at my life and those um, those things that, you know, made me who I am today, good and bad, um, it was really difficult and really confusing to figure out how to balance the fact that, sorry, I'm going to get, a little bit choked up, that I loved this person so much and that this person did something so horrible. And 
the incredible shame that came with it. It was this really dark secret. Like I said, my relationship with my father had been very different. Um, And so even once he was in jail, um, I always used to say like, you know, to myself growing up was I had the best dad in prison. (laughs) I had this person who on the one hand, like I said, I, you know, I loved (laughs) and it was very confusing, um, really difficult to process. And the way that she's been able to come to an understanding of her father's actions for herself and for her family is by thinking of them in some way as protective. I think he felt, I don't think I know he felt a need to try to, um, to, to get my mother back, to change that, to, um, again, to save, to save us all. And then the way he could do that is by literally physically saving us all. By stealing money to buy a bunker in a remote location. Like I said, even to this day, there's still a part of him that feels like there's, like he's going to still get to be the one to rescue and save us, you know, save me and save our family and his ideas on how that's going to happen or, or what it might look like are different as time goes on. But I think that whole idea to him is still really appealing. I'll make sure, make sure Monica watches and see how you edit this thing, because I'm still leery, right? Monica, you there? I'm here. I'm Monica? here. Monica? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. I was just on okay. mute, yeah, sitting yeah, quietly. Yeah, yeah, your, your dad loves you. Uh, and then you make sure you watch Antonio and them real close when they edit this thing. <laughs> okay. And I'll, and I'll talk to you later, okay? Okay. Next time on Norco 80. The bank robbery goes from being an event to police legend. On May 9, 1980, one of the most daring and spectacular bank robberies to occur in the United States took place here. Five heavily armed men would commit a robbery at this bank that would result in two of the suspects being killed. In our final chapter, how we still feel the impact of the Norco bank robbery today. This week's episode of Norco 80 was written and produced by me, Antonia Cerejido, and by Sofia Paliza Carr and Maria Alexa Cabanaugh. The show is a production of Elias Studios in collaboration with Futuro Studios. Leo G is the executive producer for Elias Studios. Marlon Bishop is the executive producer for Futuro Studios. Audrey Quinn is our editor. Joaquin Kotler is our associate producer. Juan Diego Ramirez is our production assistant. Fact checking by Amy Tardif. Engineering by Stephanie LeBeau. Original music by Zach Robinson. This podcast is based on the book Norco 80 by Peter Houlihan. Our website is designed by Andy Cheatwood and the digital and marketing teams at Elias Studios. The marketing team of Elias Studios created our branding. Thanks to the team at Elias Studios, including Kristen Hayford, Taylor Kaufman, Kristen Muller, and Leo G. If you want to hear more Norco 80, please follow or subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, NPR One, the iHeart app, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review the show.